Hey, deserving listeners, Love is Blind, Season 4. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Keep in mind that since this is a psychology YouTube channel, anything I say could get into triggering material. I usually try to provide a trigger warning if I'm going to get graphic with something that could be more likely to trigger people. But a lot of people have different triggers, so you want to talk with your therapist if you have a sensitivity. It's a real thing. I don't want to harm anyone with the content. So, you know, keep that in mind. Watch with care. Let's watch. Great about both. How'd you sleep? Well, actually, it slept really good. I don't know, it was like, it felt so like real, like being in like an actual like house. Like, I woke up at like 7 a.m. and I was like. Yeah, you wake up like a little Energizer bunny. <laughs> just like <laughs> popping out of bed. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> what you got planned for today? Oh, actually I'm talking with Irina tonight. <laughs> oh. Okay, so this looks promising. I mean, I, I don't know why I would word it that way. I guess I'm just a romantic at heart and I want people to fall in love. There's of course no reason that people have to fall in love, but it's just nice to see when people have the satisfaction of a secure companionship relationship. It's neither good nor bad if they work out, but I, I don't know, I guess, well, what do I hope? I don't know what I hope with this couple. I would just hope that for Micah, she, along with everyone on the show, but I think maybe particularly for Irina and Micah, that they're able to explore what's going on with them such that whatever went wrong, they're able to not only apologize, but also dig deep and figure out what led them to that to, to those behaviors. I'm guessing it has something to do with some defense, some insecurity of theirs. It's just a guess. I don't know. Usually that's the case. When when we're harmful to other people, it's usually because we're scared, hurt, worried, feeling hurt, feeling like we don't matter, feeling like we're going to lose. It's just a classic human thing. By the way, so if they are looking east, which I think they are from Seattle, my wife Stacy grew up on that second hill there. And that's miles to the east, by the way, in Bellevue. And then I grew up another little bit out in Issaquah or Sammamish, which is in the foothills of, of those larger Cascade Mountains. And I would go skiing in those mountains <laughs> and still do, I guess. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it goes. I have faith in you. You'll handle it. Maybe I'll go see Zach. Oh, yeah, you should. Didn't he ask you to hang out last night? Yeah. You ditched like, him. No. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Hanging out with my fiance in bed. I like, <laughs> have more important things to do. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Bigger fish to fries at. I mean, I will say the foot stuff is promising for the relationship. It shows that feeling that you have in the beginning of a relationship, maybe that is sustained over time, this compulsion to touch each other, to feel that contact with someone else. It's not always present, but when you first fall in love, and that could last for a few years, it doesn't usually last forever, but certainly elements of it can. But in the beginning, there's a lot of infatuation. We seem to have evolved some mechanism in our brain that we can't really measure. There are certain neurochemicals, oxygen, oxytocin, this kind of thing, dopamine, that seem to be related, but it's just hard to know. We don't have the technology to really understand why the brain acts like it does. But we, it wouldn't stand a reason that in order for procreation and also for mutual support and bonding, not only for procreation, but also for resource sharing, this kind of thing, looking out for each other, that when we couple, when we find our mate, then we are very compelled toward them. It's not just like, a, let's procreate. It's like, I want to spend all my time with you. I want to look at you. I want to laugh with you. You're the best ever. I can't stop thinking about you. I want to touch you. I want to look at you. I want to tell you I love you. And I want you to tell me you love me. You know, when I watch the, these shows, that is something that I'm often looking for as an indicator of at least the beginnings of a possibility of relationship. Of course, you can have this sort of thing and within a week break up or even within five years break up, but it's hard to get past this first phase without something like this happening. Now, with the couples that we watch on this show and the various other shows, they might have it behind the scenes and they don't reveal it in front of the cameras, which is possible, but when you see it, you imagine it's happening in other contexts as well. So it points in the direction of at least it lasting to the next step. That doesn't mean that they'll both say yes at the altar, though. I, I have a really hard time imagining. But I don't know. The more I see this, the more I think, well, maybe. But, like, honestly, the end of the trip in Mexico was kind of hard for me to, like, wrap my head around. And you letting me know that you were, like, talking, like, about, you know, like, my fiancé, like, behind my back, like, sucks. It did kind of, like, put me in, like, a really negative headspace. Yeah. 
Paul. Like, I don't know what Micah is intending. Is she wanting to give Irina an opportunity to apologize, to salvage the relationship? Is she just getting it off her chest? Irina seems to react okay in the moment. She's not initially defensive, but she didn't say much. Let's see how this goes. He said that, like, okay, now that you say something, I wasn't going to say anything, but, like, she was, like, touching me, being all feely in the pool, and, like, that was, like, behind, like, my back, and, like, like how do you think that makes me feel yeah. when, like, I was literally your lifeline to all of these girls. Yeah. You had no one to talk to. Yeah. I stuck up for you. That's interesting. She's saying, I was your lifeline to the other cast members. You had no one else to talk to. Huh. Yeah, I was wondering, their dynamic was so interesting. Who was the ringleader? And that's a one way of looking at it. Another way is who's adjusting to who? Who is trying to please someone, the other person? Who's adjusting themselves so that the other person is not uncomfortable? And at least, Micah, and it sounds like Irina is agreeing that Irina and her, in, in the beginning of the pods, maybe I, Irina confided in Micah or something, or Micah picked up on it, that Irina didn't like anybody else or felt uncomfortable for one reason or another. We could imagine that, right? I mean, I, I, Irina, I don't know. I, I have a feeling she's been through a lot. I don't know. We know she immigrated when she was a young child to the United States. And I think she might've been young enough to not experience the ostracization and isolation and possible bullying, but there's a pretty good chance that she did experience some of that. And that can cause Tremendous trauma and schemas that can result in a lifetime of being suspicious of groups of people. I, you know, if you're the the new kid in town and you're never feeling like anyone likes you, you know, you can imagine. In fact, I bet you anything. A lot of the dynamic that happens when the pods on each side that a lot of people's high school and childhood school peer traumas emerge. And those who don't have a lot of peer traumas from school fare much better, that they adjust much better. You know, you could just imagine that happening. The fella who didn't want to tell Marshall about having a deep connection and wanting to marry Jackie, I don't know, but he gave off a vibe of someone that might have been through some stuff when he was younger at school. You know, just imagine that feeling. It's such a unique experience where suddenly you're thrust into this compound that's isolated from everything, and it's just 15 people, you and 14 other people, and you live together and eat together and go through dramatic events in your life together. You're competing against each other. You know, the, the things that would emerge for people that are reminiscent of when we were younger. So who knows, but maybe Irina had some of that experience and she was really desperate for some someone that she could depend on, someone that would even just talk to her. I mean, just imagine, and I'm guessing that that does happen, right? Because we don't focus on everyone. Most of the people we don't focus on. And imagine that things just get off to the wrong foot and you kind of head into a social anxious hole and you're just trying to get through and you're like, oh, it's day three. Everyone knows that I don't have any friends and it would it would be pretty rough. I feel like there are situations where I'll feel like that even in my old age. I'll be at a conference or something and there will be like a breakout group where you're supposed to pair up with people. I'll admit that there's some anxiety, like what if no one wants to be my partner kind of a thing, but it's like, who cares? But yeah, you know, we all are living in a sea of insecurity and the times when we don't notice it are good, but I think it's kind of a default mode that a lot of us can go into, particularly under those kind of stress circumstances, particularly if they're reminiscent of when we were growing up seeing difficulty. But anyway, so just imagine for Irina that there's a point where she's like, I, I'm going to live the next 10 days in isolation, just like I was when I was a kid. Who knows? Total speculation. And then Micah comes along and who knows how that developed it's possible that they felt similar to each other in a certain way. Maybe Micah also was insecure about that. I don't know. It's hard to know what happened there. And I, I could be reading into a lot, obviously. But like she was like touching me, being all feely in the pool. And like that was like behind like my back. Well, like, like how do you think that makes me feel yeah. when like I was literally your lifeline to all of these girls? Yeah. You had no one to talk to. Yeah. I stuck up for you. I always was like, that's my yeah. bitch. She's a good person. Yeah. Like I never left your side. 
I? Was I the big fool here that like yeah. missed your... I mean, another element here is that Micah is outing Irina in a way that could be pretty mean to Irina. I mean, I think there's a possibility that Irina appreciates bluntness and is okay with this, but there's a different way that Micah could have worded this. <laughs> She's really throwing a lot of stuff out there. She's saying, you hit on my, my partner and how do you think that makes me feel? And I was there sticking up for you and you were feeling isolated from it. You know, the, she, she's saying a lot of things that if I were a little birdie on Micah's shoulder, I would just say like, you know, just stick to one thing at a time. <laughs> like if you want to get to all these things, it's fine. But, and I actually will have to deal with this in couple therapy. A lot of times people will come to my office and sit down and then they just go on a tirade. I mean, that's a strong word, but they will list a lot of things. There's a couple of reasons. And it is important to think about in your own life with your relationships, your partners, to think about one thing at a time, one topic at a time. Because it's hard to tackle even one topic at a time, but when you throw 15 out, it gets really hard. So I think there's some reasons why people do this. One is because once they have the floor and they're talking, they're worried that once they stop talking and the other person begins to talk, that they'll be thrown off their task and then they'll never get the floor back again. And that's not necessarily true, right? Another thing is I think that people feel like they have to pile on a lot of different things to justify the one thing. Whereas if they just say one thing, they feel like no one will listen to them or it won't be received well. And that's possible. But of course, the solution isn't to pile on a bunch of things. I think also another reason is because they feel like, well, I need to get this off my chest, but I don't think this is going to work out. I don't think we're going to have a back and forth. I don't think they're going to listen to me. I don't think we're going to understand each other. I don't think they're going to adjust. I don't think they're going to believe me. So screw it. I might as well just blast them with 15 things and then they can get defensive and then it'll all go down you know, uh, in flames. So for Micah, I don't know what she's doing. For Micah, a <laughs> table. <laughs> so with my couples, when they do this, I will ask them to focus on one thing at a time because it's much easier to have a back and forth so that we can actually resolve one thing and then move on to the next thing. Uh, another thing that people will do is when even you bring up one thing to your partner, they will respond with another thing. Like you might go to your partner and say, so you know how I asked you to take out the garbage last night and you didn't do it? Well, it just bothers me when you say you're going to do something and you're not, and then you don't do it. And then your partner says to you, well, I asked you to go to the store for me the other day and you just didn't even do it. And it's when I'm there as a therapist and when I do these kinds of things in real life, I try to catch myself. But the when we do that, we're just blasting and then blasting and we're trying to win this game. Like, what game are we trying to win and how do you win in that game? Everyone loses when you do that. So I will slow people down. I'll be like, okay, we'll get to that second thing. It sounds like that store thing is important to you. And for sure, we'll get to that. But let's focus on one thing at a time. Let's try to resolve this one thing. Because another thing is, is most people, in my experience, have never seen people actually resolve conflicts in a healthy way, particularly some people, right? So they don't even know what it looks like. They think that healthy communication is one where you blast each other verbally and there's no violence. Because for them, there might have been a lot of violence, a lot of abuse, or a lot of abandonment, rejection, instead of seeing that there's an even healthier version. The next time you have a request of your partner, whether it's along these lines, you're looking for an apology or you want them to change some behavior, is to, again, start with those primary feelings of hurt and fear. You hurt my feelings. That thing you did hurt my feelings or and or I was worried that I was going to lose you. I was worried that it meant that you didn't really love me. Just stick with that because usually we will transform that into anger and control. Like you shouldn't say that because husbands shouldn't say that sort of thing. Or my past boyfriend never said that to me and he was a good boyfriend. You know, that kind of stuff is often hurtful and concerning to your partner and throws them off the what's actually happening. But anyway, so you tell them the primary feelings. And then, so, she, you know, she could say, and she's basically saying this, is just like, hey, it, it just hurt my feelings. I thought we were friends. And then the other person reciprocate. 
and says, I'm sorry about that. Of course you felt that way. I have my reasons. I can tell you it doesn't excuse it. And I, you gave a lot to me and I didn't give, you know, it. both people. You know, often I'm framing this talk in the position where we're the hurt one and we're the one that is expressing that. But another important thing, and I talk with clients about this all the time, that when your partner is on the healthier side of things, maybe they're not completely healthy as they're communicating something, you got to rise to that occasion. You got to be non-defensive and listen and reward that because if you want them to come at you in a healthy, non-accusatory, non-hostile way, in an open way, in a trusting way towards you, you got to prove it to them that you can be trusted in that. And if you reward that with, you know, you have an impulse to get defensive and to defend yourself and to discount and to say, "Well, you're wrong because you were interpreting it wrong." You know, if you refrain from that and you reward it, people are more likely to tell you things that are important, and they're more likely to come at you in a in a healthy way. So th that whole system needs to be in place. You need to both be vulnerable, but you also need other people. And for some of you that don't watch with your partner, I know some of you do, and shout out to you that watch with your partner, you can have them watch these videos sometimes as some kind of a, a little primer on this. And of course, there's couple therapy that can help and workshops on communication. But you can also just explain to people the things that I'm talking about. Some of you may have. In fact, comment below. I'd, I'd love to hear if you have effectively educate because some people might be looking for advice about how do I tell my partner I've been learning a lot of things on this channel and I've been trying to get my partner to be this way and get our relationship going in that direction but I don't know what to say and I don't know how to convince the other person so let's brainstorm ways to do that all right well if you want to support what we're doing here you can become a patron of the podcast when people become patrons it literally gives me the monetary ability to do this what i'm doing right now if i didn't have patrons i would have to be working at the university obviously more and have more clients and so i wouldn't have time to do this sort of thing so if you can become a patron it really 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 does help honestly it's no joke <laughs> So I, I really depend on that. And it's kind of scary, you know, when you think about it. It's like at any point, people could just stop becoming patrons. And, uh, and uh, you know, some people say, you know, don't go in the detail about it. But I don't know. I feel like we can be truthful to each other. And thank you to the people who have been patrons for years. For uh, you, I thank you greatly. <laughs> Literally, uh, you know, I couldn't do any of this stuff without you. And I, I think about the patrons every day. I, I check on Patreon every day, and I don't know. It feels nice. It feels great to get to know people, and take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.